Glad to see you again. This is Zach Grisette with Buildbox, and I'd like to welcome you to part three of the Make Your Own Game series. In part two, we learned quite a bit about collision shapes and matching them to the graphics we added to Glitch. In part one, we learned how to make sure our assets are just a bit forgiving when creating them. Additionally, we went into great detail about object settings and object components. Now in part three, we are going to learn about world settings and how they affect your game. We also learn more about character settings, more specifically how to define the behavior of your character in that world. Finally, in part three, we are going to build more levels for Glitch. We will build one level together and then I'll share a time-lapse video creating a number of others. The goal is to have at least 10 levels completed by the end of this video. To get started, let's discuss world settings and character settings. To find the world settings, go up into the mind map in the upper left corner and click on the mind map button. Billbox takes us up into the mind map where all of our user interfaces and worlds live in the game. Select the world we have been editing the scenes in to reveal the settings for that world in the options panel to the right. You can set different settings for different worlds in the same game, however Glitch doesn't require this. The first setting we see in the world settings is the name of the world. Naming your worlds as you create them makes them significantly easier to find when you're looking for them in a game's mind map. Be sure to name your worlds as you create them. The next setting is gravity, fairly self-explanatory. Gravity affects the weight of the objects in this world. The first box affects how much gravity affects you on the x-axis, and the second box is the y-axis. Change the gravity to negative 20 on the y-axis. Double-click the world to access its corresponding scenes. Go to this last scene here with the spiky enemy and select the scene by clicking on it. Next, hit D to duplicate it, followed by S to solo it for testing. Click on this fixed enemy and delete it. Also, delete the enemy with the life spawner component attached to it. Drag in a platform and resize it to have the correct scale. Next, change the preset to be a physics object so that the world settings affect its behavior. Use W to duplicate the enemy and see how differently it behaves with a different y-axis value. Notice it looks too fast. Change the Y gravity to plus two and have a look to see how they keep up with the character. That's a much better speed. If it moved too quickly, it wouldn't be visible in the game because it would be too fast to be captured by our camera view. Input negative 0.5 in the X axis gravity and see their behavior. As you can see, they are falling to the left into the negative direction of the X axis, so gravity is fairly simple and it doesn't take a lot to get a reaction out of things. The last setting was 0.5. Let's go ahead and reset our gravity to 0, 0 and have a look at time warp. Right now, we have it set to 50, which is a fairly good setting to start with our game. Currently, the game is progressing at a great pace for beginners. But let's change time warp to 100. This is considerably more difficult, but it's definitely something to possibly change about Glitch in the future. Change the time warp back to 50 so the game isn't too difficult to start. The next setting is friction. Friction increases or decreases the friction between all objects. If a game required difficulty in pushing an object, this setting would solve that. Set friction to 550 and move some of the platforms against the wall. Use shift to drag them in a straight line. Turn on debug mode to make it easier to see where the collision shapes are and use W to duplicate a few more up the wall. Test out friction at 550. Given that the character comes to a complete stop, the friction setting is too high. Change friction back to 50. Velocity drag is the next setting to cover. Velocity drag places a force on moving objects causing them to slow down. In layman's terms, it's mud for momentum. Input a 3 in that setting and test what that does to the physics objects in our scene. Notice how their momentum is affected like they're moving through mud. Change velocity drag back to 0. Bounce will change the bounce force between all objects in the game. Input 250 and try it out in the game. Notice how much the character is bouncing off the walls. Revert the setting back to 0. Score multiplier is used in distance-based scoring. It allows you to increase or decrease the points earned as the character progresses through the game. 
This will come up again when we begin designing Glitch's user interface. Game direction changes the direction the game is played in, and camera smooth is a more advanced feature that adjusts how jittery the camera behaves during certain mechanics. For now, it's best to leave this setting alone. Align camera borders aligns the camera borders with whatever value you put in for game direction. So if you were to put in a value of 45 in for the game direction, and then move your character side to side, with the camera borders being gray and not yellow or red, then the camera will shift at an angle of 45 degrees and then negative 45 degrees instead of directly side to side. This can be useful for isometric games. The grid is the gray grid lines that show in the world nodes. These lines are designed to help you place assets and line things up. Grid rotation is the amount of degrees you would like to rotate the grid. This can also be useful for isometric games. Grid size is the size of the grid and it's measured in pixels. You can set the size in both the X direction and Y direction to however many pixels you would like. Object deletion threshold is a setting measured in pixels. It controls the distance from the character at which objects are deleted. As an example, once an object reaches 1000 pixels behind the game's direction, it will not be rendered in engine. This is useful for optimizing performance on mobile devices. Forced movement affects whether or not the game auto scrolls or remains static like in a traditional platformer. Double click on this world and access the character settings. Now that you are familiar with the animation settings covered in part one, let's discuss the sound settings. Buildbox accepts MP3s by simply dragging them into the engine, similar to PNG sequences for animations. There are also settings for lighting and tilting your character when it moves. Additionally, there are game over effects that will be covered in another video. Next, let's cover the gameplay settings. Max speed is just the maximum speed allowed for the character's movement. Hypothetically, if there was an action to increase the character's speed for a short time, it wouldn't exceed the value inputted here. The first box affects the X value, and the second affects the Y. Bounce force is similar to the bounce setting we saw in the world settings, however it is only for the character. Jump force determines how powerful jumps are in the game. This is useful in developing platformers, especially when working in conjunction with gravity. Jump timeout is used to vary your jump, so a higher value gives the player the option to hold the jump button down longer for a bigger jump. The jump counter is how many jumps can be executed before hitting the ground, so if you wanted to do a double jump, you would put a 2 in here. Ground threshold is a setting used to detect when the player is on the ground and able to jump. Jump from ground determines whether the player is able to jump in midair or required to jump from the ground. Left lean force and right lean force will lean or rotate the character when moved in that direction. Platform friction is the force that brings the character to a stop on a platform. A low value in this field makes the surface react as though it's icy. Rotation drag is similar to velocity drag, but it affects the rotation of the character instead of the velocity. Air drag behaves like platform friction, but the air instead of the ground. Direct movement allows moving the character around the screen by directional controls. Force movement is a setting that constrains the character's movement to the movement of the game view. Fixed rotation prevents the character from rotating regardless of any other influences. Image direction means the graphic will point in the direction of movement. There are also components you can add to characters, similar to the object components we added to our enemy in part two. That will be covered in another video. Instead, let's move on to creating more gameplay. I'll cover the creation of one level and then speed up the creation of at least nine more. Begin by removing the physics objects in scene two. Select and delete them in the scene or the outliner. There are two ways to add assets to the game. It can be dragged from the asset library as covered in part one, though that would require the addition of other components. A similar way to create multiple enemies is to duplicate them. Enemies can be copied from one scene to another.
Go to the start scene and copy one of the mountain-like enemies. Return to scene 2 and click on the scene editor to make it current and paste the enemy into it. Rename the platform to wall. Next, resize it so it takes up a good portion of the scene. Enter negative 1 into the x value of the scale to flip the image. All of the shadows need to be beneath the mountains. To do that, flip the x-axis for them in the same way as done in the previous step. Preview what's been completed so far in debug mode to see if the collision shapes need any adjustments to them. Drag in a new enemy by grabbing the entire PNG sequence and dropping it into the scene and releasing while the object option is selected. Select the new enemy in the asset panel and adjust its collision shape before adding more into the game. When creating the collision shape, keep in mind to make it smaller to assist the player of the game and create a better experience for them. Once the collision shape is created, preview the scene and test it out. One thing to note is that it's unnecessary to build every enemy from scratch by dragging it from the asset panel. It's much more efficient to instead duplicate them by copying and pasting them. Notice that it's best to test as more is added to the game. Testing is done by soloing the scene, previewing it, and playing them to see if it works. A lot of changes are also made to the mountain-like enemies, making sure that the shadows look appropriate with each other. Several layering changes are made, some look better on top and some below, so continue to experiment to see what looks best. Once again, the best intentions for game design don't always initially work out, so testing regularly ensures that the game works best. Additionally, utilizing a random scene order requires that one scene must work with all others. Keep that in mind as you create more levels for your game. If all enemies have the exact same velocities assigned to them, the gameplay may not be exciting or engaging. Mixing both random velocities and specific ones keeps the game from being too predictable, but also from being too hard. Also, consider the player when creating a game. Glitch is beginning to come together perfectly. In the next part of the series, we'll cover character components, adding new gameplay elements, and making our game unique. See you in part 4.